Well, good morning again, guys. Bring up a little bit more illumination if my... That's it? That's early? Okay, I must just be going blind. It seems dim in here today. Um, so as I said, we're back. Uh, for those who are unaware, a couple of weeks ago I was in uh, Dallas for... Huh, Dallas? Uh, and I'm wearing the hat again today because, if you remember, I had like an injury a month ago. And I forgot to wear a hat yesterday, or two days ago, 48 Plus Club. And Neil said, Tom, what happened to your head? And I said, I forgot to wear a hat. So, but I am with my Dallas hat from the conference, uh, and then uh, last weekend the leadership was gone, and a lot of people have asked about those two trips, and they were awesome, and I'll sprinkle things here and there throughout the talk today, I'm sure, and then I, but I'm, I don't think I'm covering a lot. We're going to be unpacking things as time goes on, but feel free to ask questions afterwards if you want to know more about the trip. But uh, for now, I want to kind of bring you guys in on the loop of what we were talking about at the retreat last week, what God's been talking to me about for quite some time. Uh, it won't be overly surprising I, because it's not anything new as much as it is a, a little bit of a fire, a little bit of a flame um, flaring up underneath it and some clarity on some areas when it comes to the church. So uh, we're going to be talking about quite a few things, and this is going to be a continuation of a sermon series called Church Bullies, as you can see on the screen. However, I will say this, uh, that picture is really kind of disturbing to me. Am I the only one? Like just having that guy stare at you, that, that doesn't bother some people. You, you live in some weird neighborhoods, because if you got that coming in your window, uh, so we'll just go to the next screen. There we go. Oh, so much more pleasant. Okay, but um, with Church Bullies, the first of this series was about three or four years ago. It is the first time that God ever said, hey, here's a kind of a series, but I knew I wasn't going to do week two on week two. I just was going to be kind of a Holy Spirit-led thing, and it took a while, but we're back to it. The first uh, sermon in this series is on bad pastors, what the scripture has to say about bad pastors, what we see in our culture, the damage that bad pastors do, what a good pastor should be living up to. Um, and we uh, put that out there if you want to see that. Again, that's on our YouTube channel. I'll refer to a few past things as we go along with this. Um, with our podcast, now especially since COVID, um, like if we have a, a good podcast, like where you just take, take the sermon and put that out, it might get like five to 20 views anymore. Uh, most people rely on Facebook Live or the YouTube Live and doing the replay than they do with the podcast, at least in our environment. Um, before COVID, Good podcast might be like 40 to 55, 60 for our size church. You know, that was kind of about the, the average of things. Um, but then we've had a couple that seem to be hot button topics that a lot of people don't talk about. Uh, the Mental Health Series did really, really well uh, as far as views outside of our area. Um, our number one uh, sermon is uh, the our honest and, um, and um, o open uh, study on homosexuality. Uh, which is from seven years ago. That is, it, I haven't looked for a while. Last I looked, it was a little over 1,300 views uh, because, again, people don't talk about that issue um, in a loving and truth standpoint. Uh, so it got a lot of traction. Bad Pastors is actually number two of all the sermons if you look at YouTube. We, we've had over 1,200 views on Bad Pastors because the church, we generally don't talk about those kind of things. And, um, and I, it was interesting because, like, I remember, like, getting a phone call from an associate pastor in Michigan who was dealing with a bad pastor situation, his lead pastor, and uh, was saying, we're, we're struggling hard. We don't know what to do up here, how to do biblically. He's got the spiritual authority. I, I do not. How do we do that? And, and I found your sermon and was able to kind of mentor them a little bit through some, a little bit of that situation. It's just the type of things that we as a church don't always really do well talking about. Uh, so today is week two. I think, like I said, four years later. Uh, on bad churches. So now we're going to talk about bad churches. It would be somewhat repetitive of my last sermon in some areas. Um, when we were talking, remember when we ripped apart the plant? That was fun. Uh, and David tells me that the plant is still alive. Barely. Barely. He, said, he says it will not be alive this time next week. So let's celebrate it while we've got it. The plant is still alive uh, for now. But um, I want to get a lot of things on one page so that we can kind of get things in the same ballpark. So we're going to do that uh, now that I've made it sound really enjoyable, right, uh, in Revelations. So if you will, let's go ahead and get our Bibles out. We're going to Revelation. Uh, we'll put two and three up on the screen. 
I think I'm going to read for the context a little bit from Revelation 1, uh, which I did not put in U version. If you're using U version, 2 and 3 are there, but not the, uh, chapter 1. Uh, again, if you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in the baskets underneath the chairs around the room. But um, a- after we talked last week with the leadership, and we had, just, again, an incredible re- retreat and incredible uh, conversation, our biggest prayer was God invest into us so we could invest it back out. And uh, he definitely answered that prayer. And um, so we, we've, we talked about some things, some of those things we might be able to share with you today. But as I was reflecting on it more and more, I was reflecting on what are the, to me, and again, this is just Tom stuff, what are the kind of the categories of bad churches in our culture today? And I, I told Jenny last night, I made a list of them <clears throat> on a piece of paper. And then just out of curiosity, I got to wondering about these seven churches that we have in Revelation. And if you're not familiar with them in chapter 2 and chapter 3, it's literally seven letters that Jesus dictated, the seven churches that were around during John's time about the struggles that they were dealing with and how he felt about it. And I was was like, I wonder if I go back to these seven churches, like if there's any similarities. And every single one of the top, like the, the categories I was talking about are represented within these. Um, so what I want to do today is go through these <clears throat> and look at what we still see in our culture today. Now, I'm sorry, I've got this <clears throat> in my throat, and I don't know how to get rid of it there. But the, uh, I, may, I literally made somebody cough back here. Um, it's like a yawn. I made people cough. Uh, what you got? Oh, my honey's taking care of me. There's one cough. Uh, Ginger. Ginger's passed something off to my wife as well. This is a whole different love gift. These are good. These are good. I don't know if I'm supposed to have OxyWime up here, honey. I'm joke. Horrible joke. Bad joke. Okay. This will help. Thank you very much, guys. Um, but, again, if you go to your YouTube channel and go to the playlist, there is a series of this kind of wet your whistle a little bit. It was a series on the seven letters to the seven churches. And it's really interesting from a church history standpoint, if you look at these seven letters in the order that they are and the issues they were dealing with, and then you compare it to the stages that the church has been through from the time that Jesus ascended to when he comes back again, the seven stages of the church match up these letters. So it was very much for these churches, very much for the church as a whole, and I still, like I said, I think it has principles for today as well. So if I'm going to set up uh, a little bit of the context, I'm going to start in chapter 1, uh, verses 9 through 20. If you, if you don't have it there, that's okay. Uh, trust me the best you can, and we read it later, make sure I'm not making stuff up. But this is Revelation, this is uh, John speaking. So he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. If you're not aware, John, uh, this is John, the apostle John, this was Jesus at the beginning. Um, Patmos was a prison island. Uh, Some of you guys might remember when we were kids, they taught us that Australia started as a prison island. Do you remember that? Before it was civilized, like in Europe and um, Asia, if they had murderers, if they had rapists, if they had like the worst of the worst in their culture, uh, when they were found guilty, they would be sent to Australia and just dumped off on the shores and left because they couldn't leave Australia. We don't have to deal with you anymore. That's what Patmos was. They, that's where they sent the worst of the worst, the rapists, the murderers, and John because they were tired of him and the word of God. So that's where he's at. And usually that's when you say, okay, it's time to retire. But this is when God decided to, to be able to use him anymore. This is, this is usually when John would say, I don't want to do anything. And then God would make him anyways. <laughs> Sorry, inside joke with a buddy of mine. Uh, so God decides to use him anyway. So verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Uh, and I, I promise you, I won't say all of them correctly, but to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergam, uh, to that place, to Sardis, and to Phil- Philly, and to Lady Asia. Seven real churches, se- seven real, real places. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one stood, uh, looked like the, the, the Son of Man, clothed in a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were a flame of fire, that's judgment. His feet, like uh, bonus bro- bronze, that's judgment, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many 
waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, uh, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Any guesses on who he's seeing? Jesus, right, right, he's the, the, the son of man. And all of these, if, 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 you, if you have time, some time, and I've got a great book that goes through this, all these are symbolism of, God, of Jesus' judgment, his power, his passion, his intimacy. It's, it's incredible, everything he just said about Jesus here. 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades, which he got victorious over after his death before his resurrection. And he says, Write therefore the things that you have seen, that those are... Um, those that are and those that are to take place after this, which is us. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, as for the seven golden lampstands, as for the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the lampstands are the church. If, everybody got that? It's Revelation. We get all kinds of symbolism in it. So then he writes out these seven letters, and I'm, I'm going to go through them with you uh, out of order, but we're going to start out properly with Ephesus, the first season of the church, uh, where he writes this, he dictates this, and John writes it down. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I'm the one amongst, that holds the church, I'm the one that's walking amongst the church, I am watching the church. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know that you are dealing patiently and bearing up my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Sounds good so far. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So... I'm going to kind of keep a list here, and, we're, and if you can't see it, move. Uh, and if I misspell anything, give grace. But, okay, so Ephesus, if we compare it to some of the churches that, church systems that we talked about out there, what was their problem? What did they have going for them? What was the problem? Hey, that was a, not a rhetorical question. What do you think? What did they have going for them? Hard work. Hard work. Patience, holding on to the truth, right? Right? Now, so the holding on to the truth, what was the problem? But I have this against you. Remember the Bibles out on your lap? There you go. They lost it. That's the first love. So if they're having success and truth, but they've forgotten about love, what are we looking at? The 100% Truth Church, right? So this is going back to just a couple of weeks. 100% Truth Church. Janet's going to take you a little bit of looking because it's all boxed up now, but will you find me a better marker? Thanks, babe. Um, so we got the 100% truth church. This is also a lot of times where we find bully leaders. Um, I've got a pen. If not. Hey, hey, what you got for me, girl? Sweet. You just nullified my wife. She's going to love that. Is this black? Yeah, it is. Okay. Chris just bought one up. It's okay. okay. Do I have them hidden? I'll take... Oh, okay. No, she, she got it for me. Um, okay. So, here, the 100% truth, no love. They forgot no love. Uh, actually, if you have a board, my mentor, Bobby Ken, wrote a great book on this particular church uh, that's fabulous to go through. So, he says, if you do not get your crap together, if you do not repent... What's going to happen, that last one? I'm going to come and remove your lap, lampstand from its place. That's how serious he is about love, being in the mix with the truth. I will remove you if you don't. However, verse 6, you have this going for you. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. They come up a couple times. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. To the one who conquers, to the one who repents, to the one that changes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If you do not start loving again, I will remove you. However, if you repent and change, then I will have you eat from the tree of life. What's the tree of life? That's eternal life. If you go back to Genesis 
in the garden was the tree of life, so was it the tree of knowledge, which they were not allowed to eat from. They ate from the tree of knowledge, what it brought sin in, it brought corruption in, it brought all the crap that you and I deal with every day. And then God took and moved them out of the garden because, according to the scripture, they could not eat from the tree of eternal life because you couldn't bear you and I having eternal life on this planet. We, we, we think we have it so bad because sin got introduced. Hi, Kathy. Because sin got introduced. But you and I had the possibility of being stuck here forever in it. And he moves it to the kingdom of God. So that's when we have eternal life, that we have it with freedom. So that's how serious he is with this. Okay, so we're going to put that bully leader back in there. This is great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, okay, let's look at the second one. And we'll go a little bit faster as we go. Pilgrim. They're over in verse 12. To the angel of the church of Pilgrim write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. So right off the bat, what's, what's the sword if you think about the armor of God? It's the word of God. Okay? So he, 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 he always announces himself with how he's going to deal with them. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you have hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed amongst you, where Satan dwells. So they're doing good. Okay, they're, they're, they're still together. They're, 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 they're loving one another. They're communing together, and they're, they're following God. But I have a few things against you, which you never want to hear from Jesus. You have said, oh, you have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Remember, we just talked about them. God, oh, Jesus doesn't like them very much. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Okay? So now, we drop there. We got Pokemon. Okay? If they're loving in the community and they're strong together, but... They're now mixing in other thoughts of other religions, other practices of false religions, and tolerating those things into it. What's the problem here? 100% love. We got the 100% love church here. Now, again, I know I just talked about both of those in depth a couple of weeks ago. Make sure you go back into that. But what uh, we're looking at here is that as much as he hates not having love here, he hates not having truth here. That's why it's got to be 100%, 100%. Here is where we start moving away from bully leaders. And uh, let's call them, it's all good, leaders. This is where we start getting into uh, churches being welcoming and reforming instead of welcoming. If I go into a church and I've got sin in my life, and it's 100% love and 100% truth, I'm never going to be challenged to ever grow my holiness, grow in... Uh, Working out my salvation. I mean, I, I really don't want to go to the church that says, Tom, you're perfect. Just the way you are. I want to be loved. Thank you, Kathy. I'm glad you came. You can leave now. The, <laughs> that's the only reason you came. Just to say it. No, I'm kidding. But uh, I don't want that. I want a place where we have disagreements. I want a place where we have to struggle through things. I want a place where we can hug each other and get into the Word of God together. That, that's what we're called to do. So here... If I'm home at church, he's about to take, take and wipe the church out. Here he says, I'm going to go and cut you down. I'm going to cut you down with the word of God that you're ignoring. I, have you started to pick up a trend that Jesus seems to be pretty passionate about his church being the church? Third one. We're going to go over to Sardis, so I'm going to take you over to chapter 3. And put those up by your turn in one page, maybe two. Because again, my Bible's the Godzilla Bible right now. It's huge. Okay. Sardis. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write this. These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, the one that's in control of the church. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will yet come. Um, yeah, I didn't tell you the good news for Pilgrim, did I? If they repent, then they, uh, they're the one who conquers. They'll get hidden manna, 
and they'll get a white stone, they'll get a new name written on it that no one knows except for the one who receives it. In other words, Peter gets a new name, right? Or Simon gets to Peter, Saul gets to Paul. You and I get new names that are in intimacy with the Lord for those who overcome and, and hold on to the truth. In Sardis, we have a different situation where the church has a reputation of being alive, but realistically, they're dead. There's nothing really going on in depth within it. Um, with Sardis, what I put here, and let me explain so no one gets mad at me. Uh, well, you're going to get mad at me anyways, probably sooner or later in this. Uh, and I put the parentheses around it for, the, for a reason. I put the traditional church here. Now, that does not mean all traditional churches are of Satan and God's about to cut them down with the sword of truth. I'm not saying that in any way, shape, or form. I'm talking about the traditional church mentality, which I define as when you put tradition over the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Um, so here we start seeing country clubs, churches. I get, a, I get a vote. I get to do whatever I want as long as I'm a member. I'm, I'm part of the club, so I, I've got my, my certain rights as part of that. Um, this is, can also be what uh, some call the ex-community church can fall into this. Um, that, if you've ever seen, uh, and I'm not recommending it as a pastor because of the language and the violence, but uh, nonetheless, there's a film with Clint Eastwood's in uh, El Camino. Remember El Camino at all? Um, it's kind of that feel where the church starts out and it's all country around them in the 1920s and they build the church and grandma and grandpa this and aunt and uncle that and everything's great and everything's wonderful. And then the community starts changing around them and it becomes much more urban or much more city. And those within the church that have been there forever don't know what to do with that. And instead of taking and say, okay, how do we reach the culture that's now around us? It's how do we become a bubble to protect ourselves from the community around us? Uh, how do we how do we protect what we've been instead of seeing where the Spirit's leading them next? Uh, the traditional church can be just, again, it's alive. There's a lot of people go to that church, whatever the case may be. But in reality, they're dead because they're no longer following the Spirit and they're just protecting what they had. Does that make sense? Uh, okay. I, th I think a lot of us have seen that in our, in our lives before. But, but here's what he says to them. Verse 4, chapter 3, Yet you still have a few names, a few people in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. I love that phrase. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I have no desire to get into once saved, always saved, or not once saved, always saved right now, but that phrase should make somebody shake in the boots. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Do you notice that phrase repeats a lot? It's saying, I'm saying it. Now you get a choice whether or not you are going to hear it and you're going to lean into it and you get these promises instead of the judgments that I'm talking about so far. Fourth church. Uh, does anybody know how to spell that one? Starts with a T or say that one? T, T. Thyatira, yes, that's right. Congratulations, you have passed my test. Verse 18 of chapter 2. To the angel of that church, right, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished, uh, burnished? Yep, I hate this church. Bronze. Okay, again, this is judgment. This is what he's coming at them with, is my judgment, my purity, my righteousness. I know your works. I know your love, I know your faith, I know your service, I know your patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. That sounds pretty good. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Well, that's a little tough. Athiria. Okay, so let me explain just a little bit, and if you want to go deeper into it, um, 
on the spirit of Jezebel, once again, if you go to our YouTube channel and do a search for Jezebel, I did a, I kind of forgot about this. I was talking to a friend about the Jezebel spirit this week. Uh, but there's a sermon I did a couple summers ago on the spirit of Jezebel um, that uh, might be really helpful to some. Because when it, the spirit of Jezebel is, when words before you to here, it goes back to a woman in the Old Testament that Elijah went up against and uh, she was quite overwhelming. Um, it is a spirit, I'm not going to do the full teaching on it, but it is very selfish. It's very, as far as a self mindfulness of what I want, what I think needs to happen. I'm going to take down anybody else that, disag that disagrees with me. I want it my way um, and much worse. Okay? And in this situation, we will always have different sins that people struggle with within the church. It's not saying that because she's in the church and they're trying to reach out to her that he's going to knock them down a notch. They're saying you're tolerating this. You're allowing it to continue to happen. Uh, the spirit of Jezebel is so overwhelming that in most cases, the person it's coming against will not be able to take down the spirit of Jezebel. It takes reaching out to the friends and the people that are being influenced by the spirit of Jezebel to throw Jezebel down. That's why he says, I'm going to take out her children too. I, I'm, not, I'm not going to stand for this. Now, in the loosest of terms, because I, I don't want it to sound as bad as, well, no, I guess I do want it to be as bad as what it is. If I have traditional church here, as far as mentality, for me, like I said, I'm going to make somebody mad somewhere. This is going to be big church mentality to me. Once again, I know big churches that are awesome. I'm not saying all big churches are bad. But there's a big church mentality that is not anywhere near the scriptural understanding of how church is supposed to be. I, have read, I was talking to Jenny about some things on the way here. I have read books. I have been in seminars. I have been sitting under teachings of some of the most atrocious things you could possibly ever hear of what the church is supposed to be versus what God has created it to be. It is how many people can we get on Sunday morning? How do we entertain them and make them want to come back? How do we continue to grow that so that the public sees how big our church is? I know churches in our community that teach their leadership how to, when something happens, go back and get on stage and say, I dreamt about that two months ago when they never did. I, I've seen so much manipulation, it's, it's insane. And, and I, I think that, uh, yeah, yeah I, think, I think God doesn't like it. And I think people get hurt by it eventually, and I think people walk away from God for, from it, and I think they walk away from church from it. Um, and I think we're going to be held accountable for that, those who are, are playing those kind of games. Um, it's, it's, I, I wrote when I was at the thing in Dallas. The conference I was at Dallas was this mentality, to be honest. You had to take things and say, okay, how does that really fit our church? Um, when you're sitting there and you know you're not watching people lead worship, you're watching a rock and roll show. And you know, you know with the, the lights and the music and the way that they're acting, uh, I, I love that the guy never puts his arms down, but once announcements start, you might as well put the, I mean, the, like, the, the, sooner or later it's a show. And sooner or later for some, and I've talked to people, for some who are living out their rock star fantasy at church because they couldn't make it someplace else. Um, same with pastors. Same with pastors. Uh, unfortunately, with the, being an authority role that's up front, there are people that are called, and so other people that want to be an authority and want to be up front. It's, it it could be really, really nasty. And, and I think that self-focus, how do we entertain everybody, how do we become a consumer church, matches up uh, in, in this sense to the spirit of Jezebel. It really do. But, 24, to the rest of you who do not hold this teaching, who have learned that what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay any uh, on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end to him, I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earth pots uh, are broken in pieces, even as myself, I received authority from my father. 
and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the, what the Spirit says to the churches. It's amazing to me that in this one, Jesus does not say, I'm not sure if you notice this, the spirit of Jezebel can be so bad and so overwhelming. We've dealt with it three times over our 20 years at the church. Um, that he doesn't say to them, for those who repent, you get this. He says, to you who are not under its spell yet, hold on, I've got this. I'm going to deal with this. The only thing, I, I don't lay any additional burden on you. I know you're already stressed out by what you're seeing, and it's a challenge. But those with the net mentality that sees the problems, hold on, I've got this. Okay. The last one I get, oh, by the way, yeah, we'll put this on the, this also tends to be the political churches. I should push somebody's button somewhere. Okay. Last one I'm going to give you uh, is Lady Asia. So we're going to go over chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Lady Asia, write the words of the Amen, the, the show shall be, the, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you would either be cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, Jesus says, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove, and I discipline, so be zealous and repent. Okay, so Lady Asia. Oh, I walked away from my Bible. How do you spell it? L-A? C-E-A? Okay. This is going to be lukewarm. Now, this is where we start getting more and more interested. Um, you remember how I said that these also represent the different seasons of the church and what the church struggles with from the time that Jesus ascended to the time he comes back. Remember that? This is the last one. This is the last letter. This is the last church. This is the last season. Guess what season we're in? We're in the season of Lady Asia. We're in the season of the lukewarm church. So all of these fall into Lady Asia. But Lady Asia does not just cover these four churches and these four mentalities. This covers the number one challenge, I think, no matter what church you go to, of Sunday morning only Christian. This covers everything from a standpoint of I'm just kind of get, getting through my life and I'm trying to be a little bit better than I was when Jesus came into my life. Jesus, if you could just sprinkle a little pixie dust blessing on me, but I really don't want to change anything in my life. I don't want to be challenged in my life. I don't, I don't want to take and do the ministry that you called me for in my life. This is all lukewarm. And, Jesus, and this is the crazy thing with me, because I don't know if you're a cold drink person or if you're a hot drink person, but for Jesus to say, I wish you would rather be cold than lukewarm. It's kind of a big statement. Man, I sure would like to have some hot coffee. I get that side of the comment. But he said, I would rather have you be cold than lukewarm. It goes back to the parable of it is better to not say I'm in than to say I'm in and not do it. That's the lukewarm Christian. That's what he's challenging us with. And he's about to spit that out of his mouth. He's disgusted by that. Do you see how the church is challenged today? This is his bride. This is who he loves. This is the only plan to reach the world. This is our Christian community. This is, this, this is what he desires for us and desires for the world. And this is where we're at right now. We're seeing all the seasons kind of coming together within our culture. That's why people are having a problem trusting us as Christians, as they see it. Well, I was going through some stats, uh, and this is going back to the, the Delaware thing. And I realize I skipped two churches. I'll come back to them here in a minute. Um, but looking at statistics, and I showed this with our, with our team last week, when there was a survey done in two, 2020, no, 2000, 20 years ago, where they ask people, not Christians and non-Christians, just ask people as a whole, do you think Christianity is a positive thing? 
They're not asking, are you a Christian? They're not asking, you know, what's your background, whatever. Just do you think overall, whether or not they're right or wrong, do you think Christianity is a positive thing? And we've got about a 65, 66% positive rate on that, uh, which at least it's majority. It's still the way that they graded when I was in school. That's still a D, but we're there. We're there. The same question asked last year, we dropped more than half. Well, it was more like 32, 33% say that Christianity is a positive thing, not whether or not they believe in it. Um, our culture is changing so fast, it's un in insane. The, um, it, it, and I do believe it's a true statement. I kind of watch the politic end and the conspiracy theory end. But I do believe that's why can Christianity is pretty much the only religion that people can make fun of right now without backlash. Um, I do believe that you can make statistics say things that are 100% correct, so I, I won't say that up front. But um, if you look at the statistic of those who think Christianity is a positive thing in our country right now, and you look at the statistic of how many people are Christians and actively involved in their Christianity, it could almost suggest that the only people who think Christianity is positive is us. That's how bad it's gotten. Now, I looked at that, and I saw looking at, like, my Facebook friends and, like, my, my influence on social media uh, stand, standpoint, ministry-wise. And I don't think it's that cut and dry. I know a lot of people that aren't Christians that see it still as a positive thing. But if I'm honest, I see it, I have a lot of friends who are pretty spiteful towards Christianity that are gracious towards me, but Christianity as a whole, not something that they're all that crazy about. Uh, a matter of fact, I've been realizing the last couple of years, one of your most important ministries in some cases is just being favorable. Just being favorable. Letting people see the real thing. That, that's a huge step before they even think about coming to look at Jesus. The, the conference uh, in, in Dallas, and one of the breakouts, the guy was talking about in that room like two years ago at that conference, he had one of his favorite conversations in the session he was leading, and it, it was kind of on the, the ballpark about how Christian, or non-Christians see Christians. And he said he was talking, and a woman raised her hand, and this is, well, I mean, the conference was about 2,000 people, but the breakouts are like 60 people crammed in a little room type thing. And uh, a woman raised her hand, and, and uh, she said, now I know why I'm here. And he goes, well, what, what do you mean? She goes, I'm not a Christian. She goes, a friend of mine invited me to this thing. She didn't tell me that much about it. Next thing I know, I'm sitting in the middle of 2,000 freaking pastors. And I'm like, why am I here? She goes, but now I know because I'm the person you're talking about. He goes, really? He goes, how do you view Christians? How do you view the church? She goes, all oh, the church is full of spit. But she didn't say spit. <laughs> and he said, well, tell me what you mean. She goes, you guys, are, you're, you're hypocrites. There's people in this world that get ostracized, and they come into your church, and you ostracize them too. There's people who need help that you guys talk about loving and, and helping the community, and I never see you guys out in the community. And just, and just, just lay out like that, a very fair things to say to the church of not being what we claim to be sometimes, especially in, in, in certain areas, especially within certain lives. This is a huge problem, and if we think that God doesn't care, or that Jesus is not going to step in and spank some butts, we're wrong. We're wrong. Um, I, did, I did left out two churches for you. I'll put them on here just so you can see them. If you can't see them because they're too low, start sitting in the front row. There's Smyrna, and there's Philly with the really good sandwiches. They are the two good churches. They got good reports. Smyrna was good, but they were persecuted. And so he addressed their persecution and how they stay strong and how to survive. And they were promised once they do that they will get the crown of life. Philly is a good church, and they're alive. They're, they're doing what they're called to do. He promises them that they will be a pillar in the temple of God. And he will write the name of God on them and Jesus' name on them as well, showing intimacy. Showing intimacy. Let me give you four quick points and then I'll get into my rant. Hey, that's something to look forward to. This honey one, whoever gave me the honey one, that, it's lasting forever. Is that gin? Whatever it is, this is really good. Uh, Chris, if you give me the slide with the four bullet points on it. Five. 
the honey's kicking in. Um, they don't take a lot of commentary. So I just put them all on one slide so the no takers can have it. Here's what we got to get on the scripture. Jesus sees the church. I know it's a no-brainer. I don't think we think about it a lot. Jesus is serious about the church. He's walking amongst the church. He's evaluating the church. He's reaching out to the church. He's bringing judgment to the church. Jesus celebrates the church with what he sees going well. And fully, he has concerns about the church. And in every area that he takes an, has concerns about the church, even with the most violent of judgment terminology, and we see in some of these letters, Jesus offers grace to the church. He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has an ear, let him hear. I want to make sure I can see this. Mike, I'm going to mess this up. Okay. Granted, there's only five candles. I can't do all seven. That's okay. We'll leave the good churches out. For one of the churches, the specific judgment that was to come upon them was a snuffing out. All of them was destruction if they would not repent. So from Jesus' perspective and what John was seeing as Jesus walked amongst the candles which were the church, he would say to the 100% truth church, the 100% love church, the traditional mindset church, and the big church mentality, I'm going to remove you. If you don't repent, I'm going to remove you. Does that not make the church shudder? The question then becomes, if Jesus decided to write a letter, the TSF, what would it say? And don't say, oh, okay, that's with the church leader's standpoint. In his letters, he say, I see these two people doing here. I see a couple people over here doing that. I see this over here. He's aware of you. What would his, his, his letter be? My hope would be, right? Hey, we're hanging out with the post, good persecuted church and the good life church. And then we're waiting for our letter from TSF. If there's a major shift coming, and I share with our team, I believe that there is in the church as a whole. And I think it's already started. One of the things that I uh, was, was looking at and exploring was a, a theory that someone mentioned that if you look back at church history, once again, from the time that Jesus ascended to now, about every 500 years, there's a major shift in the church. The last one was the Reformation. If you've not looked up the Reformation, you might have heard of the, the letter being nailed on the front of the church and the problem the churches were having. And if you sin, then you, if you pay the church 20 bucks, then you're, you're okay again. And people didn't have access to the Bible, and the church leaders did. So all you knew about the Bible is what the church leaders were saying, and it wasn't always 100% correct. And a guy stood up and said, that's enough. And it caused a major shift in the Scripture. That was about 508 years ago. And if this is truly the culture of the church in the United States, and that's truly how people see Christ, that's truly how people are responding to our witness that we're supposed to be leading people to the Lord because of our love and our unity and our truth, and it's not happening. And you look at the fall of all these national pastors and ministries that have been going on for the last four years where Jesus is cleaning house, and that doesn't wake us up a little bit. That's huge. That's huge. And I truly believe one of two things are about to happen in my lifetime. A major shaking of the church, which means a lot of people are going to be displaced, hurt, and confused. And they're going to be looking for the real thing as Christ is looking for the real thing or the rapture. I believe it's going to be one of those two things. Personally, one of the things I was talking to the staff about is I, I see all of them growing in awesome ways and moving into new ways within the church. 
Like if you look at things from a full chair standpoint, uh, we've kind of laughed about it, but like everybody at least has moved up one butt cheek, up a chair, <laughs> and, and to the discipleship and to the walls. And I do believe that that it happens naturally. That's been something that's very much part of our goal here at TSF with our leaders, as well as those that are in the church, just again, any laity person would be. But it's also freeing me up in some areas because I think God is putting a flame underneath the message to pastors, to churches. We've got to repent. And I think we've got to be going out to those who've been hurt by church before and say, we get it. We get it. I understand why you think that, that, that we're full of spit. You need an ally there. That's a big word in our culture right now, isn't it? Can the church actually be an ally to people who've been hurt? And I've seen the hypocrisy of the church. Because I really want to be on this side. I really think we'll have to, or else God's going to come and deal with us. Let, let me finish up the, the, the study with this, because this was our study Thursday. Um, and Chris will put up on the screen a, a scripture to you that I'm just going to kind of summarize in Matthew. Matthew 16, 13 through 19, if you want to look it up later. Um, but it is the telling of Jesus taking the apostles. And some of you guys might kind of remember this particular testimony where he asked them, what, what do people say I am? They're trying to get, you know, just kind of doing a little bit of a, like a prayer survey type thing that you're supposed to be filling out. What do people say I am? And they, they say, okay, you're Elijah, you're a prophet, you're this, you're that. And the people in the general ballpark, but they won't, miss, they won't get in all of Jesus. They didn't realize he was the Messiah. That's basically what that comes to. That's how, what culture was seeing him, but not fully seeing him yet the way that he is, which, again, we as the church represent who he is in this, this world. So that, that's kind of that level. So then he says to them, who do you say I am? Which hopefully would be with the church's response. And Peter does his, his announcement. I, you're the Messiah. You're the, the Son of God. Good, great job. Blessed are you. You didn't come up with that by yourself. The Holy Spirit revealed that to you. So it's not really you, I guess, I'm congratulating. But, but the Holy Spirit revealed it through his church into the world. So that's what we need to be able to be doing, right? And th th how many people remember it so far? Kind of? Kind of remember that? Okay. This happened in the area, according to the scripture, uh, in Caesarea Philippi. In Caesarea Philippi, and so, sorry everybody who was there last week, I'm going to repeat myself. But Caesarea Philippi was an area in Israel that no Israelite wanted anything to do with. It was an area that uh, was known for its false religion, for its paganism, for its history of child sacrifices where babies were born to false gods in these caves at the, end, at the bottom of the cliff. Uh, where children had been murdered. Uh, it was just like the worst of the worst. And the, the only thing it was used for now is the Romans had turned it into their version of Las Vegas. It was their, their, their space to come and sin on their, their vacation time. That's what Caesarea Philippi was. It's not necessarily a place you would go for a spiritual retreat. It's not the Mohican State Lodge. You know what I mean? But Jesus took them there for this conversation. That's the only thing that's around it is this conversation. And so after he says, what's the world think of me? Gotcha. Yeah, what do you, does the church think of me? Gotcha. He says, on that proclamation that he is Christ, on that, on that stone, on, on that stone pier, what you just, I'm building my church, and nothing will prevail against it, not even the gates of hell. The area where they were standing because of the babies that were killed there with fires to pagan gods was literally called the gates of hell and was literally thought of by the culture at the time to be the entrance into hell. And so Jesus went straight up into hell's house and said, you will not win this. You will not overcome my church. He is a jealous, passionate, beautiful, mighty God. And we are his bride. We are his bride. And nothing will come up against it. And he has no problem getting up in Satan's face about it. But we need to be able to step up behind Daddy and say, me too. Me too.